Hello Year 2! So this is the video that goes along with Activity 3 for Week 1 of our English activities and this story is called Paddington Turns Detective. See if you can spot and hear any unusual vocabulary or maybe new words that you're not quite sure of the meaning of and you can write them down either in the sheet that you can print out from the blog or you can go on to um, Purple Mash and there is a piece on there under to write which lets you write them in on there by typing them in or you can just do it on any piece of plain paper that you have at home. So this story is called Paddington Turns Detective. The old box room was finished at last and everyone, including Paddington, agreed that he was a very lucky bear to move into such a nice room. Not only was the paintwork a gleaming white, so that he could almost see his face in it, but the walls were gaily papered and he even had new furniture of his own as well. In for a penny, in for a pound, Mr Brown had said, and he had bought Paddington a brand new bed with special short legs, a spring mattress and a cupboard for his odds and ends. There were several other pieces of furniture and Mrs Brown had been extravagant and bought a thick pile carpet for the floor. Paddington was very proud of his carpet and he'd carefully spread some old newspapers over the parts where he walked so that his paws wouldn't make it dirty. Mrs Bird's contribution had been some bright new curtains for the windows which Paddington liked very much. In fact, the first night he spent in his new room, he couldn't make up his mind whether to have them drawn together so that he could admire them or left apart so that he could see the view. He got out of bed several times and eventually decided to have one drawn and the other left back so that he could have the best of both worlds. Then something strange caught his eye. Paddington made a point of keeping a torch by the side of his bed in case there was an emergency during the night and it was while he was flashing it on and off to admire the drawn curtain that he noticed it. Each time he flashed the torch there was an answering flicker of light from somewhere outside. He sat up in bed rubbing his eyes and stared in the direction of the window. He decided to try a more complicated signal. Two short flashes followed by several long ones. When he did so he nearly fell out of bed with surprise. For each time he sent a signal it was repeated in exactly the same way through the glass. Paddington jumped out of bed and rushed to the window. He stayed there for a long while peering out at the garden but he couldn't see anything at all. Having made sure the window was tightly shut, he drew both curtains and hurried back to bed, pulling the clothes over his head a little further than usual. It was all very mysterious, and Paddington didn't believe in taking any chances. There's a picture of him staring out of the window. I wonder if you've spotted any or heard any new vocabulary so far that you're not quite sure about. It was Mr Brown at breakfast next morning who gave him his first clue. Someone's stolen my prize marrow, he announced crossly. They must have got in during the night. For some weeks past, Mr Brown had been carefully nursing a huge marrow which he intended to enter for a vegetable show. He watered it morning and evening and measured it every night before going to bed. Mrs Brown exchanged a glance with Mrs Bird. Never mind, Henry dear, she said. You've got several others almost as good. I do mind, grumbled Mr Brown, and the others will never be as good. Not in time for the show. Perhaps it was one of the other competitors, Dad, said Jonathan. Perhaps they didn't want you to win. It was a jolly good marrow. That's quite possible, said Mr Brown, looking more pleased at the thought. I've a good mind to offer a small reward. Mrs Bird hastily poured out some more tea. 
Both she and Mrs Brown appeared anxious to change the subject, but Paddington pricked up his ears at the mention of a reward. As soon as he had finished his toast and marmalade, he asked to be excused and disappeared upstairs without even having a third cup of tea. It was while she was helping Mrs Bird with the washing up that Mrs Brown first noticed something odd going on in the garden. Look, she said, nearly dropping one of the breakfast plates in her astonishment. Behind the cabbage patch, whatever is it? Mrs Bird followed her gaze out of the window to where something brown and shapeless kept bobbing up and down. Her face cleared. It's Paddington, she said. I'd recognise his hat anywhere. Paddington? echoed Mrs Brown. But what on earth is he doing crawling about in the cabbage patch on his paws and knees? He looks as if he's lost something, said Mrs Bird. That's Mr Brown's magnifying glass he's got. Mrs Brown, Brown sighed. Oh well, we shall know what it is soon enough, I expect. Unaware of the interest he was causing, Paddington sat down behind a raspberry cane and undid a small notebook, which he opened at a page marked List of Clues. Recently, Paddington had been reading a mystery story which Mr Gruber had lent him and he had begun to fancy himself as a detective. The mysterious flashes of the night before him and the loss of Mr Brown's marrow convinced him his opportunity had come at last. So far it had all been rather disappointing. He had found several footprints but he traced them all back to the house. In the big gap left by Mr Brown's prize marrow, there were two dead beetles and an empty seed packet, but that was all. All the same, Paddington wrote the details carefully in his notebook and drew a map of the garden, putting a large X to mark the spot where the marrow had once been. Then he went back upstairs to his room in order to think things out. When he got there, he made another addition to his map, a drawing of the new house which was being built beyond the edge of the garden. Paddington decided that was where the mysterious flashes must have come from the night before. He stared at it through his opera glasses for some time, but the only people he could see were the builders. Shortly afterwards, anyone watching the Browns' house would have seen the small figure of a bear emerge from the front door and make its way towards the market. Fortunately, for Paddington's plans, no one saw him leave, nor did anyone see him when he returned some while later, carrying a large parcel in his arms. There was an excited gleam in his eyes as he crept back up the stairs and entered his bedroom, carefully locking the door behind him. Paddington liked parcels, and this one was particularly interesting. It took him a long time to undo the knots on the string, because his paws were trembling with excitement. But when he did pull the paper apart, it revealed a long cardboard box, very brightly coloured, with the words, Master Detective's Disguise Outfit, on the front. Paddington had been having a battle with himself ever since he'd first seen it several days before in a shop window. Although seven pounds seemed an awful lot of money to pay for anything, especially when you only get one pound a week pocket money, Paddington felt very pleased with himself as he emptied the contents onto the floor. There was a long black beard, some dark glasses, a police whistle, several bottles of chemicals marked Handle with Care, which Paddington hurriedly put back in the box, a fingerprint pad, a small bottle of invisible ink and a book of instructions. It seemed a very good disguise outfit. Paddington tried writing his name on the lid of the box with the invisible ink and he couldn't see it at all. 
Then he tested the fingerprint pad with his paw and blew several blasts on the police whistle under the bedclothes. He rather wished he'd thought of doing it the other way round, as a lot of the ink came off on the sheets, which was going to be difficult to explain. But he liked the beard best of all. It had two pieces of wire for fitting over the ears, and when he turned and suddenly caught sight of himself in the mirror, it made him quite jumpy. With his hat on and an old raincoat of Jonathan's which Mrs Brown had put out for the jumble sale, he could hardly recognise himself. After studying the effect in the mirror from all possible angles, Paddington decided to try it out downstairs. It was difficult to walk properly. Jonathan's old coat was too long for him and he kept treading on it. Apart from that, his ears didn't seem to fit the beard as well as he would have liked, so that he had to hang on to it with one paw while he went backwards down the stairs, holding on to the banisters with the other paw. He was so intent on what he was doing that he didn't hear Mrs Bird coming up until she was right on top of him. Mrs Bird looked most startled when she bumped into him. Oh, Paddington, she began, I was just coming to see you. I wonder if you would mind going down to the market for me and fetching half a pound of butter. I'm not Paddington, said a gruff voice from behind the beard. I'm Sherlock Holmes, the famous detective. Yes, dear, said Mrs Bird, but don't forget the butter. We need it for lunch. With that, she turned and went back down the stairs towards the kitchen. The door shut behind her and Paddington heard the murmur of voices. He pulled off the beard disappointedly. 35 buns worth, he said bitterly, to no one in particular. He almost felt like going back to the shop and asking for his money back. 35 buns were 35 buns and it had taken him a long time to save that much money. But when he got outside the front door, Paddington hesitated. It seemed such a pity to waste his disguise. And even if Mrs Bird had seen through it, Mr Briggs, the foreman at the building site, might not. Paddington decided to have one more try. He might even pick up some more clues. By the time he arrived at the new house, he was feeling much more pleased with himself. Out of the corner of his eye, he had noticed quite a number of people staring at him as he passed. And when he'd looked at them over the top of his glasses, several of them had hurriedly crossed to the other side of the road. He crept along outside the house until he heard voices. They seemed to be coming from an open window on the first floor, and he distinctly recognised Mr Briggs's voice among them. There was a ladder propped against the wall, and Paddington clambered up the rungs until his head was level with the window sill. Paddington clambered up the rungs until his head was level with the window sill. Then he carefully peered over the edge. Mr Briggs and his men were busy round a small stove making themselves a cup of tea. Paddington stared hard at Mr Briggs, who was in the act of pouring some water into the teapot, and then after adjusting his beard, he blew a long blast on his police whistle. There was a crash of breaking china as Mr Briggs jumped up. He pointed a trembling hand in the direction of the window. Cor, he shouted, look, it's, it's an apparition. The others followed his gaze with open mouths. Paddington stayed just in long enough to see four white faces staring at him. And then he slid down the ladder on all four paws and hid behind a pile of bricks. Almost immediately there was the sound of excited voices at the window. Can't see it now, said a voice. Must have vanished. Caw, repeated Mr Briggs, mopping his brow with a spotted handkerchief. Whatever it was, I don't never want to see nothing like that again. Fair chilled me to the marrow it did. With that, he slammed the window shut and voices died away. From behind the pile of bricks, 
Paddington could hardly believe his ears. He had never even dreamed that Mr Briggs and his men could be mixed up in the affair, and yet he had definitely heard Mr Briggs say his marrow had been chilled. After removing his beard and dark glasses, Paddington sat down behind the bricks and made several notes in his book with the invisible ink. Then he made his way slowly and thoughtfully in the direction of the grocers. It had been a very good day detecting, and Paddington decided he would have to pay another visit to the building site when all was quiet. It was midnight. All the household had long since gone to bed. You know, said Mrs Brown, just as the clock was striking twelve, it's a funny thing, but I'm sure Paddington's up to something. There's nothing funny in that, replied Mr Brown sleepily. He's always up to something. What is it this time? That's just the trouble, said Mrs Brown. I don't really know. But he was wandering around wearing a false beard this morning, he nearly startled poor Mrs Bird out of her wits. He's been writing things in his notebook all the evening too, and do you know what? No, said Mr Brown, stifling a yawn. What? When I looked over his shoulder, there was nothing there. Oh well, bears will be bears, said Mr Brown. He paused for a moment as he reached up to turn out the light. That's strange, he said. I could have sworn I heard a police whistle just then. Nonsense, Henry, said Mrs Brown. You must be dreaming. Mr Brown shrugged his shoulders as he turned out the light. He was much too tired to argue. All the same, he knew he had heard a whistle, but as he closed his eyes and prepared himself for sleep, it never crossed his mind that the cause of it might be Paddington. Lots of things had been happening to Paddington since he'd crept out of the Brown's house under the cover of darkness and made his way round to the building site. So many things had happened, one after the other, that he almost wished he'd never decided to be a detective in the first place. He felt very glad when, in answer to several loud blasts on his whistle, a large black car drew up at the side of the road and two men in uniform got out. Hello, hello, said the first of the men, looking hard at Paddington. What's going on here? Paddington pointed a paw dramatically in the direction of the new house. I've captured a burglar, he announced. A what? asked the second policeman, peering at Paddington. He'd come across some very strange things in the course of duty but he'd never been called out in the middle of the night by a young bear before. This one seemed to be wearing a long black beard and a duffel coat. It was most unusual. A burglar, repeated Paddington. I think he's the one that took Mr Brown's marrow. Mr Brown's marrow, repeated the first policeman, looking rather dazed as he followed Paddington through his secret entrance into the house. That's right, said Paddington. Now he's got my marmalade sandwiches. I took a big parcel of them inside with me in case I got hungry while I was waiting. Of course, said the second policeman, trying to humour Paddington. Marmalade sandwiches. He tapped his forehead as he looked at his colleague. And where is the burglar now? Eating your sandwiches? I expect so said Paddington. I shut him in the room and I put a piece of wood under the door so he couldn't get out. I got my beard caught in one of the sandwiches so I switched my torch on to take some of the hairs out of the marmalade and then it happened. What happened? chorused the policeman. They were finding it rather difficult to keep up with Paddington's description of the course of events. I saw someone flashing a light outside the window explained Paddington as patiently as he could. Then I heard footsteps coming up the stairs, so I lay in wait. He pointed towards a door at the top of the stairs. He's in there. Before either of the policemen could ask any more questions, there came the loud sound of banging and a voice cried, Let me out! 
Good heavens, exclaimed the first policeman, there is someone in there. He looked at Paddington with renewed respect. Did you get a description, sir? He was about eight feet tall, said Paddington recklessly, and he sounded very cross when he found he couldn't get out. Hmm, said the second policeman. Well, we'll soon see about that. Stand back. With that, he pulled the piece of wood from under the door and flung it open, shining his torch into the room. Everyone stood back and waited for the worst to happen. To their surprise, when the man came out, it was another policeman. Locked in, he exclaimed bitterly. I see some lights flashing from an empty house, so I go to investigate. And what happens? I'm locked in by a bear. He pointed towards Paddington, and if I'm not mistaken, that's him. Paddington suddenly began to feel very small. All three policemen were looking at him, and in the excitement, his beard had fallen off one ear. Hmm, said the first policeman, and what were you doing in an empty house at gone midnight, young fellow? And wearing a disguise at that? I can see we shall have to take you along to the station for questioning. It's a bit difficult to explain, said Paddington sadly. I'm afraid it's going to take rather a long time. You see, it's all to do with Mr Brown's marrow, the one who was going to enter for the vegetable show. The policemen weren't the only ones who found it all rather hard to understand. Mr Brown was still asking questions long after Paddington had been returned from the police station to the family's safekeeping. I still don't see how my losing a marrow has got anything to do with Paddington being arrested, he said for the hundredth time. But Paddington wasn't arrested, Henry, said Mrs Brown. He was only detained for questioning. Anyway, he was only trying to get your marrow back for you. You ought to be very grateful. She sighed. She would have to tell her husband the truth sooner or later. She'd already told Paddington. I'm afraid it's all my fault, really, she said. You see, I cut your marrow by mistake. You did, exclaimed Mr Brown. You cut my prize marrow? Well, I didn't realise it was your prize one, said Mrs Brown. And you know how fond you are of stuffed marrow. We had it for dinner last night. Back in his own room, Paddington felt quite pleased with himself as he got into bed. He'd have a lot to tell his friend, Mr Gruber, in the morning. Once the inspector at the police station had heard his full story, he had complimented Paddington on his bravery and ordered his immediate release. I wish there were more bears about like you, Mr Brown, he had said, and he had given Paddington a real police whistle as a souvenir. Even the policeman who had been locked in said he quite understood how it had all come about. Besides, he had solved the mystery of the flashing lights at last. It hadn't been anyone in the garden at all, but simply the reflection of his own torch on the window. When he stood up on the end of the bed, he could even see himself quite plainly in the glass. In a way, Paddington was sorry about the marrow, especially as he wouldn't get the reward but he was very glad the culprit hadn't been Mr Briggs. He liked Mr Briggs, and besides, he'd been promised a ride in his bucket. He didn't want to miss that. And that's the end of that story. So you might have heard all kinds of different vocabulary, some words that are quite unusual, or words that we don't use very often anymore. So you could write those down and see if you can come up with some definitions.